Good afternoon. Welcome to Digital Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy. We are delighted to be offering virtual programs and I encourage all of you to follow us on our social media platforms and to sign up for our email so you receive announcements about future programs. So if you check out all of the, uh, the about section in the video below, you can see all of our social media platforms. Join us, follow us, we'd love to see you on future, future programs. The mission of the museum is to share stories of American diplomacy through exhibits, through artifacts, through programs. And in our virtual programs, we love to show you our website so you can explore on your own our virtual um, online exhibits as well as artifact stories. The a goal of the museum is also to share the work of the State Department and to inspire our audiences to learn how the State Department serves the American public and the interests of the United States around the world. And the functions of the State Department come in so many different forms that our exhibits, like the one I'm going to share with you today, does just that. So in today's program, I'm going to share with you our online exhibit, Bringing Americans Home, which um, it documents the effort of the State Department's repatriating or bringing Americans from around the world back to the United States. And in this exhibit, it documents that as the COVID-19 pandemic was taking hold and borders of countries around the world were closing. So where we had Americans in, in foreign countries who were they themselves were trying to get their citizens back, the United States was trying to get our citizens home. In that exhibit, we highlight the Directorate Operational Medicine Unit. And today our guests, uh, the museum's director, Mary Kane, as well as associate curator, Catherine Speckart, they're gonna help us better understand the work of this unit, the Operational Medicine Unit. They attended or they joined a repatriation flight. So they're gonna share with us what, what they learned on that experience. But before I bring in Katie um, and Mary, I would love to share with you our website and to show you where you can go and explore the online exhibit yourself. I'm gonna share my screen. Share my screen here, there we go. All right. I am bringing you to our homepage, so. <clears throat> Please remember our website, diplomacy.state.gov. Here you see a view of our preview exhibit, Diplomacy is Our Mission. And if you see the headers above and you go under the exhibit um, title there, you can see on our online exhibit where we have uh, six online exhibits that you yourself can explore, as well as we have um, stories of the online exhibit that you see before you, Diplomacy as Our Mission. We also feature some of the stories included in that exhibit as well. You see under the collections tab, um, we, ha we highlight some of the 9,000 objects that we have in the museum's collection. I encourage you to go in and read some of those artifact stories. And then under the education tab, attend a program. If you click into this, you'll learn about ways that you can join our virtual mailing list, as well as once we reopen, as all other museums reopen around the world, um, you'll be able to find out information about how you too can visit um, our museum. But for now, I'm going to take you into our featured exhibit, Bringing Americans Home. You have an entry point right here on our homepage. So I'm gonna go, go ahead and click that. Here you are. Okay, Bringing Americans Home. And Although this exhibit documents the work our State Department colleagues have done around the world during this COVID-19 pandemic, 
re repatriating U.S. citizens or Americans from abroad in times of crisis is something that we've been doing since the beginning um, of our agency, since the beginning of our country. There is a video here that shares some of that historical information so you can learn that it's not just in times of pandemics that we've brought Americans and returned them home, but it's also during times of uh, natural disasters as well as political unrest. If you scroll down the page, you see we have a responding to a crisis. This is a timeline of the efforts of the State Department, and it really provides sort of a magnifying glass on our government at work and how, as this pandemic was emerging, how the State Department was formulating task force, sharing information within the agency, as well as across the U.S. government agencies, and then uh, working with airlines as well as NGOs to get uh, the Americans stranded abroad um, home as quickly as possible. So I invite you to look at our timeline here. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing view into how our government works. And then through the, the body of the online exhibit, you see that we have our stories organized under regions. The State Department organizes a lot of their work through regions of the world. So you see here the African region, Europe and Eurasia, Near East region, South Central Asia, East Asia and Pacific, and Western Hemisphere. And behind each of those sections, you read stories and view videos of our State Department colleagues uh, working through the embassies in that region to get Americans in that region home. Um, because this is such a unique exhibit and our curatorial team impressively put this exhibit together quickly and as the repatriation efforts were, were, were taking place, we are constantly adding to the online exhibit. And um, our colleagues in our Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs we just collaborated or partnered with them to bring this section of the online exhibit, um, which we launched uh, last week. So our, our colleagues in uh, what we call the ECA Bureau, this is the bureau that manages the, the many exchange programs that we host um, worldwide. And these are professional exchanges, these are student exchanges, academic exchanges. And here you see some of my colleagues who once the pandemic started to take hold, they had to quickly organize um, through their partner organizations, NGOs, and through our U.S. embassies around the world to get our students uh, participating in exchange programs. You see some of the, the images here of students participating in um, exchange program. This is our uh, a NISLI program. It's a language-based um, exchange program for high school students. Quickly had to organize to get these folks home. Um, they worked very hard to bring an impressive uh, 3,500 um, folks home. And you see some of the numbers here um, just um, mentioning some of the exchange programs that we have around the world. You see um, ECA manages our Fulbright exchange program and, and you, as you see here, they brought home over 2000 Fulbright scholars back to the United States. So I encourage you to take a closer look, but as you um, enter into each section on the, uh, uh, on the exhibit, if you hit that bottom button, it takes you back to the home page of the exhibit. So it's, it's an easy, easy online exhibit to navigate. But what I would like to highlight today, as mentioned at the top, is our operational medicine um, unit that our um, director, Mary Kane and Katie Speckart had the, the distinct honor to join some of the members of this team on a repatriation flight. Um, the flight that they were on flew to Brazzaville, which is the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as uh, Yaoundé, which is the capital of Cameroon. And you see some of the images here are the view into the, the plane, as well as you see some um, citizens on board, as well as you see some family members here. You also see an image of families boarding the flight. Um, so, I invite you to take a closer look at the online uh, exhibit here in this section. 
But for now, what I would like, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna invite my colleagues, Mary Kane and Catherine Speckart to join us in this conversation about the medicine operation unit. Hi, Katie. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hello. Great. I'm great, Lauren. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And I first want to congratulate you both. You both were on the curatorial team that impressively put this online exhibit together quickly. And I know that in your joining this repatriation flight to Africa, it was an effort to really learn how this operational medicine unit operated and to collect stories and artifacts to bring back to the museum. But I would like to start with Mary. And Mary, I know that you had a really unique view here. Not everybody gets to uh, go on a repatriation flight. So what would you like our viewers joining us today, what would you like them to know about the State Department's repatriation efforts, as well as the work of this um, medicine, operational medicine unit? Well, it was interesting to know, and um, I've been at the State Department for a few years, but this dates all the way back to the very beginning. Uh, repatriation flights and bringing folks back to the United States. We're always looking out for our American citizens. But the biggest thing that was a, no one really knew about this operational medicine, unless you actually had to be one of the people being picked up by this a unique group of individuals. Um, it is, it's, there are international first responders. There's something that, you know, at, on a moment's notice, they are asked to pick up everything get on a plane and, and fly anywhere in the entire world to go basically rescue an American citizen. And I, I was, I had no idea. And I was so um, enamored with the courage and the professionalism and the drive. Because once you get on that plane, Katie knows we didn't stop for 57 hours. Wow. It is yeah. nonstop. Wow. And wow. it's not the most luxurious um, conditions. It's a cargo plane. Oh, it's so. a cargo. Yeah, and some of the images in the online exhibit kind of give you that feeling. It doesn't feel like a regular commercial plane that I would get on oh. to, right, to go somewhere. No, not at all, believe me. One of the passengers asked how she could charge her phone and I was like, yeah, I don't think that's <laughs> happening on this flight. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was, it was to see our government in action like mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. quite a privilege and to also capture history in the making. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome, thank you, Mary. So Katie, when you were on the flight with, with Mary, obviously, but what, what kind of staff, what kind of department staff is on the flight sort of assisting the, the passengers that are there? There's quite a variety of people. And so that was also really interesting to note how these different um, elements of the operation all work so well together. Mm -hmm. So as far as people who are direct um, Department of State personnel on these flights, um, they are op uh, members of the operational medicine unit team. Um, and they have a variety of skills and roles. Um, you know, there was one person whose role was primarily the communications. Um, and, you know, Mary mentioned being able to plug in your phone. Um, luckily for us, as part of the crew, we were able to plug in phones, um, you know, thanks to our communication guy. Um, and so they all have different roles that they fulfill. And so that's the State Department um, element, you know, really dealing with the medical evacuation aspect of it. They also, um, the department also contracts with different companies to help make this operation mm -hmm. happen. And so there's a group of um, flight nurses and flight paramedics that go on these uh, flights and they are contracted through Phoenix Air, a company based out of Georgia. Um, and with Phoenix Air, they also contract with um, the, the, the plane. Uh, the, you know, you have um, the pilots and you have a, a gentleman whose title, it was a very interesting title. He was the load master, Toby. And so, you know, you have the pilots who are in charge of the flight deck and then you had Toby, the load master sort of in charge of everything going on in that cargo space. And so they, they're from a company, um, an airline called Coletta Air that specializes mainly in cargo and other sort of uh, specialized chartered flights uh, like the Department of State needs for these repatriation efforts. So it sounds like you've got to be very organized 
Yes. Right. And it sounds like these guys know how to do that. So when they go out, they're specifically picking up Mary, right? Sick people. Um, not always, but usually, yes. Now they're first of this whole um, repatriation flights for uh, coronavirus. They, they're the group that started in Wuhan. Okay. Um, and actually were tasked to go in and get our folks in the embassy and any Americans out of Wuhan, China. They were then sent on to the Diamond Princess in Japan in order to bring people back. But um, when we went on the flight, we did pick up a, a family that was ill. The father had tested um, positive for the coronavirus. Um, and then we also picked up um, passengers, 130 or so, um, who were not ill, but we were trying to get back to the Just United States. Again. And of course, there has to be a way to separate them. And what our operational medicine team has done, which is very unique, and there is no other agency in the whole United States government that has this, that they have these biocontainment units where they can um, put them in the plane and then take the plane off and pick up uh, um, such as this family, put them in the biocontainment unit, keep them safe, keep all the other passengers safe and uh, take them home. Okay, all right. So, um, so it sounds like there's a mix of, of folks here. So, but you know, Katie, when I think about the State Department, I typically think of, you know, you know, multilateral negotiations, very high level, but it sounds like um, all of a sudden we're, we're kind of involved in this, this, this work. Do you have a sense of kind of who's behind it and how this got started here? Yeah, so this was a wonderful <laughs> thing for us to witness. You know, I've been at the State Department for, for several years as well, and I never knew about this aspect of diplomatic practice. And we know that diplomacy in practice takes many forms. Um, and the State Department hasn't always had this medical evacuation capability. And so in talking to, uh, you know, these personnel on this flight, they all mentioned one name. It was Doc Walters. You know, you have to, you know, they, you have to meet and talk to Doc Walters. And so he became sort of this mythical figure <laughs> while we were on this, you know, long flight with them. And so we did have the privilege to talk with him. And he, you know, he's a doctor. He's also a, a soldier, you know, he, you know, has special ops experience. He's mm -hmm. been to Iraq on de deployment. And so he um, came to the State Department, I think it was around 2011, and brought his medical know-how as well as his logistical abilities, you know, honed in the military to the State Department to be able to stand up these types of operations. Well, you know, you told me this. And so we went ahead and, and invited um, Doc Walters to join us today. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here. However, I know that um, Mary and, and Katie, you had, in fact, spoken with him um, through a Zoom call. And we you recorded that. And so we have an excerpt of that that I would love to show our viewers um, to learn more about sort of the origins of this unit and how um, it became integrated into the State Department. It's very interesting. And I also want to say to our viewers, like so many other government agencies, we, we have lots of acronyms. So as you watch the video, take note of all the different acronyms that you hear. Um, we'll try to populate in the chat how they translate, what they mean, what they represent, what offices or, um, or agencies. Um, and also, we will take some questions at the conclusion of our discussion today. So if, if our viewers out there have some questions or thoughts to share, please um, do so in the chat section. So I'm going to ask my guests to mute and take yourselves off screen. And my producer, Elizabeth, is going to show a clip of our Doc Walters. A little bit about me. I am. Um... You know, I joined the Army right out of high school. Um, I've been in for about 20, well, 30 years. Um, emergency medicine physician trained in Philadelphia, fellowship trained in emergency medical services with a focus in long distance critical care transport. 
Um, had a good position, position up in Boston, the Harvard system. Did my second tour in Iraq, done three total, and um, then sort of stayed on active duty. Went to Joint Special Operations Command, was there for a number of years prior to coming to state uh, in December of 2011. In, uh, in December of 2011, I came to the State Department as the director of myself. Um, I had this great thing about the State Department. Um, it's a good title, but that's what you got. Um, and today we're, you know, probably close to 100 folks uh, in the directorate. Uh, I came in in December of 11. Benghazi happened in September of 12. One of the um, one of the findings from the ARB uh, was that diplomatic security and really the department at large needed a um, a capability to deploy crisis response personnel on short notice. Um, and so that was you know September of 12, really into 13, and then Ebola. Um, kicked off in July of, our part of Ebola kicked off in July of 14. Um, and uh, and um, I got a phone call from a congressional staffer that said, hey, there's two Americans that have been infected with Ebola in West Africa. What are you going to do about it? I, said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up uh, what I'm going to do this early morning and uh, figure that out. So um, I knew a guy, we had done the planning for the Olympics in Sochi, and I'd run into this guy, Dan Thompson, down in uh, Cartersville, Georgia, that had this shelved biocontainment capability that he was trying to find. It was an orphaned project. I was looking for somebody to take on. Called Dent and said, hey, does it work? And this was at maybe eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it, it, it works, okay, well, there's a flight out of DC here in about you know four hours. I'm coming down with a contracting officer, get it set up. He did, to his credit. And by the time we left that day, we had a we had a way, and they launched, you know, the next morning and went and got uh, Ken Brantley and Nancy Wrightpole uh, and brought them back, and uh, and that was the start of you know, biocontainment transport. Really, it was the start of biocontainment transport. Uh, in sort of the modern age. DOD had a capability called the Vickers module, but it had never been used. Uh, and at the time, DOD's policy was they had no capability to move patients infected with highly contagious pathogens, which as a soldier was very disturbing, <laughs> I gotta tell you. So um, the, the, um, the case fatality rate for Zaire strain Ebola in West Africa at the time was um, was about 70%. And what we found was if you could get to these people and get them to a regular uh, Western hospital, either in Europe or in the United States, that the case fatality rate was zero. And so uh, we did a total of 43 transports between in 14 and 15 uh, out of Conakry and uh, Freetown and Monrovia. Uh, and then it continued with loss of fever, and you know, it didn't get a lot of press. Uh, but we've been pulling patients out with highly contagious pathogen you know, infections for really since 14. Um, so the Benghazi part and how those two tie together, so we had the ARB results, and I had a requirement for biocontainment. And so we formed this contract, a multi-mission aviation support services contract, to satisfy both which was to, to give the department a scalable aviation capability that did four things. It could do medical evacuation, it could do biocontainment, it could deploy crisis response personnel, and it could extract non-essential personnel. So we used it to go get Otto Warmbier out of North Korea. Oh, yeah. We did that mission. Um, we, when uh, a series of hurricanes hit the Caribbean in 2017, we would use the aircraft to fly in between the hurricanes. So the hurricane would come and it would hit an island. And then as it moved off and the next one was coming, the aircraft is small enough and fast enough that we'd come in in between the two hurricanes, land, pick up the injured or the medically vulnerable, pull them out, and then the hurricane would hit it again 
and then the Air Force would come in with larger aircraft and pull out the masses that, that could weather the storm there. Okay. Uh, and so we did that in rapid succession, really kind of chasing hurricanes, not flying into them, not flying through them, flying between them. Uh, if we'd had a mechanical on the ground, it would have been a significant emotional event. But uh, as it turned out, we pulled a bunch of folks uh, out of those hurricanes uh, and then circled back and supported uh, the DHS response and the HHS response. Because the other two, outside of DOD, the other federal agencies really didn't have standing aviation contracts that were scalable in that way. So whether it's operating out of Africa uh, and pulling you know, infectious disease folks out or doing personnel recovery stuff out of North Korea uh, or out of Russia uh, or you know, chasing hurricanes in the Caribbean, uh, operational medicine and the aviation component of it uh, has really proven its worth over the last five years or so. Hi, Mary. Hi, Katie. Feel free to come on back. I mean, all I have to say is, is wow. First of all, I felt like I was in his office, like just, know. <laughs> you, you know, talking with him, you know, pretty incredible that you're right there in his office. And, and what image uh, leaves with me is the aircraft that was flying in between the hurricanes, flying in before another hurricane came in and, you know, you know, evacuating the, the medically vulnerable, as he says. Uh, it's quite extraordinary because, you know, you see where the State Department has not shied away from their responsibility of repatriating U.S. citizens. But in this case, we're talking about, you know, as he says, the medically vulnerable, those that are sick. And what I heard him say is, is quite extraordinary. It's the aviation piece of it. And it's not just getting those sick Americans home. It's getting them to the closest place possible for them to get help right and for them to be um treated um so you can see he's just he's incredibly um impressive and you can see katie why as you mentioned the the the, the folks that you met on your repatriation flight you know absolutely suggested that you that you meet him but mary when i was looking at the exhibit some of the um, captions of the images refer to the guardians. So can you tell me who the guardians are? Well, it's uh, Doc Walter's nickname basically for this select group of State Department employees who are, I believe, mostly former military um, that he has corralled to okay. manage and operate these flights um, because the logistics of getting the plane ready and getting it across the world to the place where it's supposed to pick people up is, is quite complicated. Right. So uh, you need people who can um, adapt to any situation. Right, so that, and that idea of the guardian really feels like, and, and the title mm -hmm. of the section of the, of the exhibit is operational medicine in action, a delicate and careful mission. Yes. And so that <clears throat> really gives you the sense of these guardians kind of flying in and really doing their best to, to, to treat those that are, are sick. Mm -hmm. So we have another clip that I'd like to share. And this is gonna offer our view as a really kind of an inside look into how the planes need to be outfitted for a, for someone who's infected or thought to be infected um, on, on, on the plane. So I'm gonna ask us once again to mute um, and to take off our video. And Elizabeth, if you wanna cue up the second video to hear Doc Walters again, speak about his idea of how to outfit, outfit the plane. September of 2014, I get a phone call from uh, USAID off to says, hey, uh, Paul Allen is interested in spending some money in a public-private partnership. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Who is Paul Allen? They said, you know, the Microsoft guy. I said, oh, 
Uh, sure. Uh, what was the last thing he invested in? So his own space program. I said, perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I need that guy. So um, we met. I met with his chief science officer at uh, the uh, Starbucks in Arlington. At one of the Starbucks in Arlington, uh, just just outside of Roslyn. And um, I wish I still had the napkin because it was no kidding napkin sketch. This is like, all right, well, what do you want? I said, well, I, you know, give me a sense of what your scale is. He's like, you haven't dealt with Mr. Allen before, have you? <laughs> He's like, don't worry about scale. Just what do you need? So um, at the time, we were flying G3s, Gulf Streams, right? So we could move one patient at a time. We had three G3s that we could do it with. Uh, I said, I need something that can move four people. And it needs to be able to load onto an aircraft and it, it can't touch the aircraft for certain aviation reasons, and, uh, but it needs to plug in for power. And so we kind of go through, literally on a, a napkin. He's like, so this is about what you need. I said, yeah. He's like, okay. Do you know anybody who can make that? And I'd done a little bit of research. I'm like, yeah, there's a company, MRI Global, that does BSL level four labs in Connex boxes that they drop into, they were dropping into Liberia at the time. All right, set up the meeting. Mm, okay. So uh, uh, I think 186 days later, um, we had the ribbon cutting of um, a custom, custom built, custom designed, custom engineered, uh, what you saw uh, that had been built inside the Air Force's C-17 safety program mm -hmm. um, and B, dropped $12 million in an unrestricted gift to the State Department to say, we like your idea, make it happen. Um, and uh, they helped us get through some of the engineering challenges, brought in outside experts to work with MRI Global uh, mm -hmm. because MRI could make labs it wasn't really, sh it had never built anything that was going inside an airplane. Uh, so, uh, so you don't really have to worry about rapid decompression and the, you know, in the jungle. So we worked through it. It's been great. Uh, we hadn't, we had used it in exercises prior to COVID, but we've used it a lot um, in, uh, in this current outbreak. I mean, the, the ability to move, you know, what you, so you probably saw us move like eight people at once, right? Like two families and? Um, just one family, but we had two of the containers on board. Okay. So in a separate mission, I think that followed the one you were on, there were two families um, full of people that were, you know, that were positive. And mm -hmm. there's no way you could get all those people back. And they all had little kids. So then what do you take mom back? Do you take dad back? Do you take mom and dad back? But then how do you get the kids? And so it, it really solved some serious logistics problems that we imagined in 14, but had never experienced until the current outbreak. Wow, Mary and Katie, you wanna go ahead and join me? Yeah. Wow, so he's the mastermind, right? By how the US government is able to fly home sick folks. Um, so what I'd like to do now, because I think for our viewers, you know, this, the biocontainment units on a flight kind of conjure up some, um, some images, but we do have some slides um, that you, of, of, of images that you were able to take when you were on your flight. So what I would like to do is pull those slides up so you can talk to our visitors a little bit about um, what, what, what really this was like. So I'm going to, again, share my screen and pull up some slides here that will, there we go. All right, so here we go. So Mary, I'm gonna start with you a little bit. So this doesn't look like a commercial plane. Yep. It is definitely not a commercial plane. There are no windows except for that second story, uh, which is where the pilots sit. Um, this is the one that came into Dulles and that we got on board on a uh, was it Wednesday afternoon. Right, okay. And I think you told me it just had arrived from somewhere else. Was it just, yeah, okay. So 
They're not stopping. They keep, they're keep moving. Okay. So here we are. It's, it's, it's a cargo plane that they're going to, um, um, fly to Africa to put the, um, the, the, um, passengers on. So Mary, can you talk a little bit about what we're looking at here? These are two of the bio containment units that the state department has to, okay. um, move sick um, um, citizens back to the United States. They are fully self-contained. Okay. They're like those um, containers that ships take when you're, when you're shipping goods yes. all over the world. They're, they're shaped like that. They're, okay. And you're able to put them right into the plane. Great. And are there two of them here? So like there's um, yes. where you see the blue straps, that's one. And then you see another one sort of down You see the farther. door. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, excellent. So Katie, what's, what is this view of here? So here you're looking inside one of the units and you can really get a great view. It, I mean, it's really like a flying ambulance um, or even okay. like a flying emergency room almost because they, they are really well equipped and you can see that they have four stretchers there. And like Doc Walters okay. was saying that you know, one of his requirements, he wants to be able to transport, you know, at least four people at a time in these units. And so the gentleman there is preparing um, all the equipment. This is um, before we uh, arrived in Africa. And this, uh, his name is Jesse Turk, and he's part of the Phoenix Air Group. He's a flight paramedic. Um, and he and his teammates just took wonderful care of uh, this family that we picked up. Um, and so they they, they fully outfitted both of those units. Like Mary said, and you saw in that previous picture, there were two of these bio units on our plane. Even though we were only picking up four people, the, the second one was kind of in reserve in case um, okay. it became necessary to use it um, as a contained unit uh, while we were in flight. Okay. Were you... So you're not, you weren't allowed to step into this unit, were you? Oh yeah, um, well, you were. before the patients arrived, yes. Okay. We, um, we took a full tour, they showed us everything. Oh, and wow. um, the other one that did not have the family contained in it was also used as a pass through okay. um, the crew. And, and we were sitting up in the front of the plane and then to get to the rear of the plane when we picked up the um, passengers that were being repatriated, you could uh, use I it see. as a pass through. I think we have, okay, so here we go. So Mary, I, you wanna tell us about these folks? Cause these, they're not sick. They're not in the unit, right? No, they're not sick. They are a family that we are bringing back from Cameroon. Okay. Um, and yes, with their entire family, yeah, I very see. small children. And it was, you know, it was, you wanted to make sure all the kids could sit with their parents and, and making sure everybody was as comfortable as you could possibly be in a cargo plane. So. Right. I mean, it worked out well. Yeah, so you're able to kind of, do, you know, get the sick people home and as well as repatriate the others as well. So that's awesome. So Katie, you know, you both have mentioned the family that went onto the unit. Is this who we see here, Katie? Yes, it is. So this is on the ground in Brazzaville and our coworker, Meiji Castro also came on this adventure with us and she was able to snap this beautiful photo. And so the family, you see the, there's a father holding his young daughter uh, in the pink outfit. And then he also has two boys. And one of the boys is already dressed in his PPE and getting ready to go up the steps. And then the other boy to, on the left-hand side in the, in the black t-shirt is, is getting outfitted. And so he um, and his wife, who had already traveled back to the States, um, tested positive. Um, and so um, you know, the wife had already been brought home. And so then the father was traveling back with these three young children. Wow. Um, and you can, you can, so you have two of the um, medical personnel there on the ground, helping them get outfitted. Um, even, you know, even the littlest guys in the, in those outfits. And they yeah. were, they were brave, brave kids. We were really impressed. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can't imagine little children seeing men all, you know, covered head to toe on these white suits. It's, it's pretty daunting there for sure. Oh, and um, obviously they're in the unit here, right, Mary? Yes, they're in the unit um, and have, have gotten out of their, all their PPE and are trying to get settled. Of course, they're 
really excited exploring everything in there, um, but getting settled for a long ride home. Oh, God bless. That's awesome. And then is that the one individual that's in the PPE, I guess that's the uh, individual that we saw the picture of earlier. He's yeah, that's, paramedic. Actually, that's actually Jesse Turk there that you see. Yeah. And they, there's a whole team. And so they, they, they rotate in a team of two, like, I think it was like every two hours or something. It was a 12 hour flight. And so they, they rotate the medical personnel who are in the bio unit with the family. Okay. Wonderful. Let me just see. Oh, so you were also on a artifact collecting mission as well, right? So what do we see here? We sure were. These, these came after the fact, but they are sort of emblematic of all, all the care and the detail. And you, know, you mentioned sort of that deliberate and careful operation that goes into these flights. And so uh, a, a member of the Yaoundé embassy family uh, sent this to us and uh, it's a, a, a spouse of an embassy employee and, and her daughter who, who were repatriated and, and evacuated um, a few weeks before we arrived. And you can see, uh, apparently there was some mix up with the passenger list and, uh, you know, they had to handwrite the um, seat assignments on, on this ticket. And um, I think in some of the pictures you might, you might see um, the, the guardians are, you know, handing out red wristbands, which indicate seat assignments. And, and, you know, they've, they've learned that, you know, obviously families want to be able to sit together, you know, and so sometimes um, passenger lists and whatnot don't necessarily um, indicate who needs to sit next to uh, certain people. And, and so this was, uh, she, uh, this uh, woman, uh, Jolita sent these to us to kind of as a, as a souvenir of the the repatriation flight that they went on a few weeks earlier. And and now in our collection, yes? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And this is another artifact in our collection that you were able to collect? Yes. Mary um, and Meiji and I were each given these little care packages <laughs> when we got on the plane. Um, so we got little packages of um, N95 masks, gloves, as you can see, and some some sanitary wipes and I also have here, we were also given these, we were given a few of these, these, this, these are awesome. <laughs> some, some hand sanitizer tubes, um, which we, we were very happy to have. So Mary, did you have to be dressed in the PPE or was the, the masks and the gloves enough for, for you guys? Um, I was dressed um, when we first got on in Dulles when they were going, because at each stop, the plane has to be disinfected. Oh, wow. So when they landed in Dulles, uh, myself and actually our videographer, uh, Mufti, we actually got on the plane while they were decontaminating it. Wow. And you have to have that on. Um, and then again, when we were picking up passengers in the Cameroon um, and helping the guardians and the folks that were that were on the flight, get everyone seated and, and comfortable and calm so that we could take off on our way home. You know, I've, um, I've really enjoyed your stories about your experience and I know that the guardians um, have impressed you both so much mm -hmm. and their work. And uh, I believe that the museum has underway a video that we're creating that will help tell more the story of who they are. Is that right, Mary? Yes, absolutely. Um, that should be up in the next week or so. We're very excited about it. And I have to tell you, I, um, I want everyone else to understand the dedication of these folks, that they will hop on a plane and go pick up sick people. Yeah. Uh, and because it's the right thing to do and it's our mission. Um, of course, they take care of, of making sure they, they don't get sick. But I have to tell you, we were on that, we were on this mission for 57 hours straight. It's not like there's a place to really lay down and take a nap. Um, you're working the entire time. Um, and, and we got home and we were beat. We got home at one or two in the morning um, right. on yeah. Saturday morning. And, and all of those gentlemen were getting back on a plane again Monday morning. Oh, yeah, no. Ready to go. Yeah, no, that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing. And these are international flights, clearly. I mean, yes. right? I mean, you're crossing time zones and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound glamorous at all. So I, I just think it's an incredible that you were able to do that and also put this exhibit together to help 
our audience and beyond better understand how our government serves the American people and what we do to get our, our, our citizens out of harm's way, not only in times of political unrest or national disasters, but, but during pandemics. Um, yeah. Many different facets of, of diplomacy. Yeah. You know, it, it's pretty amazing. You think of just sitting across a table and negotiating treaties. There is a lot more to it than that because you, we had to be in contact with the ambassadors and the embassy folks at all times because they were in contact with the local officials so that when we landed that we could be there to pick these folks, that they, the people were there so that they could get through to get on the plane. Yeah. So there, were, there was a lot of, of discussions and diplomacy that went on to make sure that these flights were successful. Excellent. And I, yeah, go ahead. Katie. I was just going to agree. That was a fascinating part of watching the behind the scenes, um, you know, that from the plane, they were literally on the phone with the ambassador um, or with other embassy wow. and personnel, like making sure that all of this was, uh, you know, going to come off without a hitch. And it just goes to show you so many skills involved with diplomacy. And, you know, it's, you know, you have these logistical aspects, but you also have sort of the, the communication and the uh, understanding of the conditions on the ground to be able to negotiate what you need. Well, and we had one gentleman, Jason, um, who was a, a GSO, General Services Officer from the embassy in Cameroon. And, uh, you know, the, the catering team um, from Yuwandi came in to deliver food, but we didn't speak French. And thank goodness Jason was there because he was able to communicate with them and make sure that um, they were bringing all that we needed we on and what it was. And yeah, so, I mean, the skill levels of just being on that plane on a tarmac and we have people coming up who spoke French too. So it was, you just have to juggle so many balls in, mm -hmm. in the air when you're doing something like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't have so much as a, qu a question from our audience, but it was more of a comment and this with less than 2% of the federal budget? <laughs> so true, uh, yes. it's so true. And you know, and it it's also goes to show you the value of uh, public-private partnerships. You know, the whole yeah. thing started with, you know, Paul oh, Allen wow. wanting to help scale up this, this capability. <clears throat> and look what good it's done and, you know, the long-term benefit uh, to serve the mission uh, of the Department of State. Excellent. The amazing part is that they're so um, able to be flexible because here you are going into different countries that have different communication systems, that have different systems on the ground, um, different languages, yeah. um, and, and different um, ways of, of uh, accepting the Americans coming in to do something like this. It's just a, a fascinating. The whole thing was just amazingly yeah, and, and all in the middle of a very, you know, contagious yeah. pandemic, you right. know, one thing, Mary, I noticed, especially, you know, when the, the folks, the ground crew, the local ground crew was coming on, you know, to deliver the catering, it was, it was a little bit like, do I want to yeah. be in this plane? <laughs> I, I don't think I want to be in this plane. Like, here, here, take it. <laughs> you know, yeah, and so go, there's, go. there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, just sort of the normal communications and logistics, and then add on top of that, the layer yeah. of, Incredible. The, the possibility of being contagious and catching something. And these guardians do these these trips over and over again. Yeah. And just the detail, you know, once they've yeah. gotten the family up and in the biocontainment unit. Yes. Well, we had to get the diaper bag and the okay. car seat um, out of the bus. That had to be completely decontaminated before it went into the biocontainment unit. I mean, it's just... The, the attention to detail is amazing because you slip up once yeah, um, and that whole plane can be amazing. Somebody gets sick, yeah. And I yeah. will tell you, no one, no one got sick. We didn't get sick at all. And we were no. right in the middle of Love all. it all. Well, bravo to you both for A, taking, you know, going on that adventure, as Katie say, said, and, and sort of bringing that all back and creating this exhibit so we, in record time, I should add, so that we could all learn sort of the, the various practices of diplomacy that the State Department and our diplomats do. Um, but I know it's important for the staff to also say that we want to give a huge thank you to all emergency international first responders, especially to our OpMed team and those guardians for keeping Americans safe 
and healthy all over the world. So thank you both for joining me today and to our, our listeners and viewers out there. Our next diplomacy classroom will be in two weeks and it'll be about the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence as we think about July 4th. So make sure you're following us on our social media channels, sign up for those emails so you can uh, learn about all of the forthcoming events. So thank you all so much and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.